Hey everybody, it's your boy Z Dog MD, Dr. Zubin Nemanja. If you're nasty, uh, we are here at Studio Z in the San Francisco Bay Area, and today I have a guest. So I've sworn from here on out, guys. And if you're listening on the podcast, if you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on YouTube, I, I make this promise to you: I am only going to have guests on the show that I care about deeply what they're talking about. They're bringing something new and interesting to the conversation because otherwise, you can go check out Rogan. You can check out all these people that are doing great interviews, like. I want to do something for us, the tribe of healthcare people and activist patients who care about making this thing better. And that's our mission is to shine a light on bright spots, different thinking, out of the box thinking. And today's guest is Dr. Leslie Carr. She is a clinical psychologist, uh, practices psychotherapy in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, is a coach, uh, a teacher, a mentor. She's done TED Talks. I met her through Chris Lindland, who is a friend and runs a company called Beta Brand. He's been on the show talking about creativity and, in medicine and how we dress and how that affects our mindset. Well, it turns out he's partnered with uh, the wonderful Leslie Carr, who as I got to know her, I realized her ideas, thinking, and approach to psychology, mental health, self-care, all of these things that we in healthcare often sacrifice in our own lives, but fail to really properly understand in the lives of our patients. This is her bag. So today we're going to talk about all the things. Leslie Carr, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Did you like my very, to be here. my very professional? It's very professional. Right? Yes, I'm impressed. I know, because yeah. like five minutes before we go on, I'm like, okay, <laughs> Hey man, is this vodka or what? And, I suddenly and, feel like I'm in the presence of greatness. You know, yeah. it's uh, it's not easy being a triple threat. That's I true. Uh, I sing, mm. I dance, mm -hmm. and I sing. So this is three. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Leslie, like, um, we got to know each other over like tacos or something. Mm -hmm. And immediately I was like, I love her. I love her. Not in a creepy way. Maybe a slightly creepy way. But I didn't, I didn't feel creeped out good. by Good. So yeah. then at least I wasn't projecting creepiness. <laughs> but I realized that we are in many ways a kind of siblings in terms of what we think about mental health, mm -hmm. the mind, and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, how was it that you even got into psychology? And tell me a little bit about your degree and your training. Yeah. So <clears throat> to back up a little bit, I, uh, I went to a therapist for the first time when I was 10 years old. My, you, I, you went to one yourself. Yes. Ah, yes. I, I made, I, and I made that decision myself too. No, I'm just kidding. My parents decided to send me. <laughs> I was going to say, mommy, for yeah, Christmas, I, was, I, I would like. quite precocious. <laughs> no, my, my parents made that decision for me. I, you know, I, I grew up in Westchester County, the suburbs of New York City in the 1980s. I was born in 1978. And I made this connection and conversation with somebody recently that I think that that was part of what greased the wheels for me to have my first therapy experience because I happened to live in a part of the world at a time when it wasn't stigmatized. It was very sort of Woody Allen before Woody Allen was a problematic figure. Everybody had an analyst. Analyze this. It, yeah. Yeah. It was very, you know, psychoanalysis and psychotherapy was really popular in that area at that time. And, you know, my family was beset with a couple of challenges. My mother had brain hemorrhages when I was a kid. Mm. And my, luckily, my parents did not think that psychotherapy was something that should be stigmatized. And so they sent me to a therapist for the first time when I was 10. I worked with that therapist until I was 13. And by the time I left that course of treatment, as we like to say, I felt like I knew what I wanted to be when I was going to grow up. Wow. So that is actually how that story came to be. So so the ther <clears throat> was it that the therapist was particularly connecting with you or was it an intellectual interest in that process? I think that she was a good therapist. It's a little bit yeah, hard for me to gauge fully because I was a kid at the time and it was 30 years ago. And But um, I have every reason to believe that she was a very good therapist. Mm. I think she helped me tremendously. And I think I also had the good sense at that point in my life to realize that she seemed to have a pretty baller lifestyle. Like her <laughs> her practice was attached to her house. Like um, what was that TV show that was popular in the 80s with a the therapist? The oh, dad uh, that Alan had the, Thick. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like pains. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, she sort of had that kind of lifestyle. Right. Right. And I was like, seems like this chick has kind of got it figured out. And then, so, you know, that was the first time I went to therapy. It certainly wasn't the last. I went, um, you know, went to therapy again when I was in high school. And it was an amazing experience to have an adult to talk to who wasn't one of my parents. And then, it, it's so nerdy of me, but I just, I knew what I wanted to be. You know, I knew what I wanted to do. So 
I actually signed up to take AP Psychology as an independent my senior year. Wow. I didn't even know there was an AP Psychology. I, I don't think most people realize that that, you know, I don't, I don't think most people knew that that existed, but I did that. And then I um, went to Connecticut College where I had the good fortune of being taught by a man named Gary Greenberg, who is, as far as I'm concerned, a legend in our field. He wrote wow. a book called Manufacturing Depression and another book called The Book of Woe, uh, The Making of Psychiatry, The Making of the DSM and the Unmaking of Psychiatry. Oh, wow. Long story titles. short. Yeah. yeah. And he was one of my undergraduate professors. And he really shaped just the way that I look at the work and think about it and understand what it is that we're doing here as humans and, you know, or are doing here as therapists. And then I actually did take some time off. I also have a lifelong love of music. So I spent some time in my 20s working in the music industry and working as a performing musician. Really? What do you what do you play? Uh, well, I don't really play anything anymore. Yeah. But at the time, I played the guitar and I sang and I had a band. Oh my gosh! Like yeah. Alanis Morissette. I people I got that comparison sometimes. Like yes. Jewel. Yeah, you know what I actually got the most was Natalie Merchant and Sarah McLaughlin. You know what? Those are huge compliments. Wow. Oh, I took them yeah, as huge. That's compliments. Because yeah. Alanis Morissette, you just be like, ah, uh, thanks. I know. But Natalie Merchant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was totally honored by those compliments. And I it was one of those things where I'm really glad that I did it. I, I'm glad that I didn't go straight from undergraduate school into a doctoral program. Because for me, there was something really important about going out and living life and having a job and business and get to learn getting to learn about other things. Like I think that that was a really important part of my life and trajectory. It's just something I really value. But by the time I was 27 years old, I was just like, what am I doing? Like I know what it is that I want to do. So I need to go do that. That's crazy that you started in music. Like I've drifted mm -hmm. into fake music as a parody artist for, you know, and I, I'd always wanted to be a musician, but I thought, well, you know, I got to do medicine for all these reasons. And, but you know, we, I, I want to back up for a second because what what was it that your parents had you go to therapy for at age 10? Well, you know, my parents had gotten divorced when I was about three. Mm. And then my mother had massive brain hemorrhages when I was seven years old. And she she survived it. She actually did eventually die of a brain hemorrhage. She mm. is no longer alive. But for a long time, she survived. But she had some brain damage. Um, and it was just... I mean, I think it was just good sense on their part to think that you should send a kid to therapy for that. Wow. Yeah. Do, do you think that for you, that was what they're calling now adverse childhood experience, having your parents divorce and having them, having your mother have those health problems? And I think it depends on how we, um, on how we gauge that kind of thing. I'm a little bit hesitant to call it that only because, uh, I mean, I suppose you could, I suppose you could, you know, there are so many things that I think we don't fully know how to account for, like resilience and that kind of mm. thing. And um, I think it, is really good that I got to go to therapy, but I don't, yeah, I suppose so. You know, it's interesting because when you studied with uh, Greenberg and you describe what he works on, that really kind of brings you to our conversation right now, mm -hmm. which is, you know, all, all this uh, sort of education, your own experience in your own career, going into music, doing all this other stuff has primed you, it seems to be the perfect person to talk about what I think is the heart of this, which is, when when we treat depression, anxiety, bipolar these days, mm -hmm. it seems that we reduce these very complex human conditions, especially in the psychiatric profession, but also among psychologists, also among primary care doctors who are prescribing a ton of medication now, to a medical diagnosis. In other words, depression is a is a medical etiology, it's a cause of something. Mm -hmm. But when you and I were talking, you really compelled me to rethink that model, which is no, it's not really as simple as that. How, how do you think about this? How do I think about this? I think that the human condition is extraordinarily complicated, which is a big part of what makes me love what I do so much. You know, it's, um, I think that people can become depressed for lots of reasons. I think it is very rarely, and this is just to start with depression, right? We'll just sort of pick depression as an example because it's not the only type of thing that a person can struggle with in their mental health, but it's a handy way sometimes to kind of get into the conversation. People can become depressed for lots of reasons. I think very rarely is it truly a result of what we would call a chemical imbalance. Mm. 
A big part of the reason why people even think that that is the case, that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance, is because we don't regulate pharmaceutical advertising in the United States, and they are in the privileged position of being able to say whatever they want, which not only makes the general public think that something like depression is a result of a chemical imbalance, right? Depression hurts, Prozac can help. It actually has even sort of infiltrated, I would argue, and I would love to hear your perspective on this, medicine, which is to say that I think a lot of doctors think that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance because the pharmaceutical industry has, has led them to believe that that's the case. One of the biggest beefs that I have, and this is why I was so thrilled to talk to you today, is I don't really have a problem with psychiatry because I think that at least psychiatrists are trained mental health professionals. I think that we have a problem right now with general practitioners writing psych scripts, operating, I would argue, beyond their scope of practice because they feel comfortable writing psych scripts. A, a drug like Prozac is oftentimes easy to prescribe because it doesn't have a lot of side effects and it's just generally safe to prescribe. But we are living in an era where people are stressed out, lonely, overworked, underpaid, distressed for lots of reasons, not to mention anything personal that might be going on above and beyond that, cancer of a loved one, someone's own cancer. Um, you know what I mean? Like it's, we are, stress is a very real and it can be a very debilitating thing. And the human brain is a little bit funny in the sense that it doesn't always feel to us like what we're experiencing as a direct result, you know, like if P then Q, you know, sometimes people feel depressed because the quality of their relationships is poor mm. or they're not really making time for the relationships that they have in their life that are good. Um, some people experience adverse childhood experiences. There are lots of reasons why people struggle with their mental health. Mm. If we switch the focus to anxiety for a moment and just use a different example, most people who are struggling with anxiety have that anxiety reduced when either the thing that is making them feel anxious goes away or their own coping strategies become um, you know, increased such that they feel better able to cope with that anxiety. Mm. People aren't struggling with anxiety because there's like a benzodiazepine deficiency happening in their brain, right? So, hey, but that's not what we're conditioned to believe. So this is where everything's okay. So so much of what you say resonates with me and it's going to it's going to trigger some people in yeah. the western model. And the reason is is that from medical school day 1, we are conditioned not just by the pharmaceutical industry, which is a real thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's a real conditioning. And and honestly, I'm not even saying they're bad human beings. I'm saying this is their incentive. They make money yeah. to reduce a complex conscious agent, a human being, to a serotonin receptor. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's what they're paid to do. So they're going to do that. And, and, and in other words, they're behaving perfectly rationally. And, and they feel ethically because they think they're, they really believe they're helping people. I think especially the researchers in pharma. So I want to, again, I want to get that out of the way because I think painting, for me, painting, um, me painting pharma as this obliquely bad thing has never felt authentically true because I've worked with these guys. However, mm -hmm. everything you said is authentically true. So mm -hmm. in other words, well, this, yeah, and we live in a world where multiple things can be true at the same time. Okay. And so it's not to make someone evil exactly. just because the problem is what it is. Exactly. And the thing mm -hmm. is that we can hold this paradox and this complexity in our mind. Now, what, what you said about, there's so much there. So we're talking about primary care guys providing uh, medication therapy for uh, mental illness. And there's been a push, right, mm -hmm. that we should broaden behavioral health uh, treatment w into the primary care space. But, and I, and I think that's fine. What I think you're absolutely right about is mm -hmm. we're missing the root cause of this. We're medicalizing something and saying, okay, the therapy is, it's a deficiency of, <laughs> of Prozac. It's a deficiency right. of benzodiazepine. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, you have a Xanax deficiency. That's why you're anxious. <laughs> exactly. Not, not that like, gosh, you know, you have a sense of, you don't have a purpose in the world and your yeah. relationships are poor quality or not. Like everything you said actually yeah. was resonating with me because I'm just now pulling out of a mild to moderate depression myself, having just moved back to the Bay Area. Everything's in chaos. I feel, yeah. 
I've done videos on this recently that just came out so you guys can watch those. And so having being deeply connected to this, if you had put me on a drug, uh, it would have been the wrong answer. Yeah. The, the right answer was, you know, my family and my team and my friends and my fans, my fans send me these messages when they see me do these videos where they can tell, they can tell months in advance that I'm not, that I'm depressed. Oh my God. All right. I'm in denial. <laughs> yeah. My family can't tell. And my fans, like my wow. su the supporters who are like subscribing, they're paying four ninety nine a month because they have these authentic conversations with me every night. Yeah. So like we're sitting there and we're just, it's just me talking about, Hey, my day was like, this is what's going on. And I'll get these messages. Hey Z, you know, uh, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but it seems like you're depressed. And I'm like, oh, come on, fam. What are you talking about? No, nah, I'm just tired. These dark circles around my eyes are genetic, right? And and it's amazing that acknowledgement of yeah. this suffering is in itself a process. Because then I start to wake up out of this denial that I put myself in. And then Tom, my producer, says, you know what? You're burned out. You're depressed. This is what's going on because yeah. of these reasons. You need to. And now, having had that, having done those couple videos where I'm like, this is what's going on with me, guys. I feel better than I felt in yeah. months. Yeah. Could could Prozac have done that or did I need to go through this? Was it more com am I reduced to a serotonin receptor, right? And I, that's where what you're saying resonates with me. Now the thing is the psychiatrists are going to push back and say no there are patients for whom it is like this is a like I worked in psych emergency services as a medical student at San Francisco General. Mm -hmm. Those patients yeah. it was not a question of like let's sit down and have therapy right now. It was a question of how are we going to get you totally. in a space where you can even sit in. Yeah, for sure. And I actually really don't mean to make it sound like I'm totally against medication or that I think that there's never a place for it. I really don't mean to come across that way. I don't think you do. Uh, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. I just, um, my fear for the place that we're in at this point as a society is that so many people think of, um, that, you know, think about something like depression as being a chemical imbalance that it's almost like the pharmaceutical solution kind of becomes the only solution. So the mm. people that I worry about the most are the people that could be having an experience like the one that you were just describing, go to their doctor, say they've been feeling blue, get the prescription, take it, maybe feel a little bit better because people do sometimes get a little bit of a boost from those medications, maybe not experience a benefit from them at all. And then what are you left with? Mm. What next? If you think that that's the only solution mm. to your mental health struggles. If you don't ever look deeper or ask yourself different questions or just think, you know, how do I feel about the quality of my relationships? How do I feel about the quality of my self-care? How do I find a place of compassion for whatever amount of suffering I'm experiencing in my life? You know, something that I see a lot in my practice and in the work that I do is that in the Western world, I think we have a way of, many people do, have a way of, um, feeling guilty for their own suffering Ooh. because we are such a privileged nation in so mm. many ways mm. that it's kind of like, well, who am I to feel bad about my life? Mm. Because it's not like I, you know, pulled my breakfast out of a dump in Bangladesh. I mean, like literally there are people in the world that are suffering so much more. So people think to themselves, like, how could I possibly not be happy? Right. And mm. meanwhile, I think that the roots of human suffering are often so much more complex than that. You know, there are children in Africa that don't have toys to play with. They sort of play with each other in the dirt that experience greater levels of happiness than people do in our culture because they have community and they have sincere support in their lives. You know, it's it's complicated. I I I. I so this to me is the central root cause of our opioid epidemic. It's a central root mm -hmm. cause of our anxiety epidemic, our identity epidemic. And we're having all these central problems. So what you yeah. said is very powerful. And I think it's going to resonate with a lot of healthcare people, especially nurses who are often have suffered some trauma, often are the sort of nurturing. Who hasn't, Jesus. Who, who hasn't, yeah. right? And so they help others as a way to help themselves. They give up a lot of yes. themselves. We see it all the time. I've done shows about why are nurses so obese? So they're more obese than the average population. Why is that? Is it because they're lazy? Is it because they uh, you know, don't do self-care? But well, it, it's largely, I think, because they put others above themselves because they don't think they are worthy, Yeah. right? And what you said about um, our first world problems, right? Like we feel, that, that's how I felt. Like I, I so we, you, you took a little tour of my house. 
Mm. It's this beautifully remodeled, it is. wonderful view. It is, folks. It's like, you know, and again, I'm saying this not yeah, because yeah, I'm like, yeah. hey, guys, check out me. <laughs> I'm Z Dog, freaking MD. <laughs> no, it's because to me, this is a simultaneous source of tremendous anxiety. Yeah. Like, as sitting in this house, it's like being in a prison. The second thing is, I feel guilt. Well, like, here mm-hmm. are people struggling, and I've, I have all this, and I'm unhappy. Mm-hmm. How dare I be unhappy, mm-hmm. right? right. Well, it's, it's for all the reasons that you talk about yeah. and that I just did these couple of videos where I'm like, this is why I'm unhappy, guys. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I think, it's, I think we're acknowledging something really important, and I'm really, I'm really happy with some of the directions that we're taking the conversation in so far, only because I think that something that I just want to emphasize for people here is that you and I are both acknowledging that we have and do struggle. Mm. And I think that I, I just, my perspective on this stuff, honestly, as a psychologist, and I think about, um, in many ways, it's a privileged position to be in because there is one idea that I have been deeply disabused of in my work is that anyone is out there having an easy life. <laughs> you know, like I, I live and I work in San Francisco. I work with tremendously privileged people, people who are, um, the types of people that when they're out in the world, other people think they have everything. Yeah. And they're in my office crying if they need to cry or talking about whatever feelings they're having because life is hard for them in some way, shape, or form, whether it's a difficult relationship they have with a parent or their marriage is dissolving. You know, it's, you know, like life is just, I, The longer I am on this planet, the more I am inclined to believe that no one gets out unscathed. I mean, it's, it's, there is a spiritual belief that we come, we, we, we come to this planet to learn, right? And whether you believe that or don't believe that, I, frankly, I think I'm at a point in my life where I'm kind of inclined to believe it. It just seems like no matter how easy you think somebody else's life is, if you think someone else is having an easy time, you just don't know them very well. <laughs> uh, 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 man, <laughs> you, know? you, you nailed it. And it's funny because me and Tom, our producer, talk about this all the time. So Tom was born a child of tremendous privilege. Mm-hmm. So dad, lawyer, Las Vegas Re- Review Journal, yeah. grew up in Vegas. His mother, severely bipolar, um, like would just basically torch the inside of the house every three months, mm-hmm. would be you know, arrested, like terrible stuff. Yeah. So neglected, but yet grew up with a lot of affluence and um, found late in life this, uh, it's, it's a mix of this spiritual belief that he was here, he chose this life to yeah. learn, yeah. and he's going to get out of it what he can and make something better. And then the second thing is that therapy. Yeah. So he started going to therapy and now he talks to me with a, a degree of wisdom that I'm like, is that you, Tom? Rock on. <laughs> so he's like, Z-Dog, here's what's going on with you and you should really think about therapy and I've never yeah. been to therapy. Oh, ah, yeah. cool. You should give it a shot. I think I'm going to have to. Cool. I, yeah, I, if there wasn't boundary issues, I'd go to you. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, I'll refer you to a trusted that's, colleague. That's even better. Yeah. Exactly. So, so how is it that you find therapy to be helpful for people who are in this sort of this sort of state of like, you know, they're not, okay, first of all, they're not the schizophrenic person who's in a locked facility, who is on a cocktail of drugs, who is barely holding reality together. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to actually make that distinction. You can tell me the difference between a person like myself or the patients that you see who are really having a hard time at coping with life as it is. Doesn't matter their level of privilege versus someone who really is Mm -hmm. having a trouble with thought disorder or with these other kind of complexities? Well, so the answer to that question is it's incredibly complicated, right? Because there is, um, a, you know, a degree of things like genetic predisposition involved. It's interesting. If you look at something like schizophrenia, it's actually pretty shocking. Cause even if you look at twin studies mm. in cases where there are identical twins, where one of them has schizophrenia, the other twin has schizophrenia. The studies show different things, but like somewhere between 13 and 30% of the time. Not that high. Not that high. So there's some degree of genetic predisposition, not a very high degree of genetic predisposition. I think that's really interesting because if you look at something like epigenetics, like part of what that just says to me. Can you define it for the Epigenetics yeah. just basically meaning that there are a lot of things that affect gene expression. And those things are um, um, the impact of stress, relationship, exposure to exposure to toxins like all of these things diet 
lifestyle stuff, exercise. So, so Liz Blackburn at UCSF talks about this in terms of telomere length. Yes, people I grow love up that with. Stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's it's fascinating. I heard her speak, and I was uh, sold that that the, the the direct epigenetic effects of our external environment are real. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There appears to be a lot of evidence that that's and, the case. And Lamarck wasn't necessarily wrong. Lamarck no, was the guy who said. No, he was not. I was talking the, about that with someone yesterday. Yeah, yeah were you? Uh-huh. It's so like giraffes, uh, mm-hmm. Lamarck used to say they have their long necks because each generation stretched it a little more, and that that stretching was inherited. And then that's really sweet. The Mendel- they're probably reaching up to find their parents. They're trying. You know? exactly. That's honestly probably <laughs> that's probably what it yeah. is. And so the theory then that had been debunked because people were like, no, no, now there's these things called genes, and of course it's just passed on as natural selection. It's yeah. not. You don't pass on your life experiences to the child. But now, yeah, that's no, starting it would to get clear re-thought. that that's absolutely. You methylate DNA. Mm-hmm. You change. You can actually change your uh, epigenetics and genetics in this life and pass that on. One hundred percent. Right. It's, yes. So, Amazing to see, you know, children that struggle with anxiety because their mothers were going through adverse experiences while they were pregnant or right. you know, all of that stuff. Right, it's incredibly right, complicated. Right. So when we talk about epigenetics, we're talking about all of that, right? You know, not just related to schizophrenia, but talking about anything where lifestyle factors and that kind of stuff affect gene expression. So that's relevant, which feels really important. Mm. But the first three years of life in human development are vitally, vitally important. Mm. A baby can come into this planet with all of the good luck and good genes in the world. And if it doesn't experience a couple of really important things in the first three years of its life, it's going to have a really hard time. And a lot of that has to do with things like attunement is the technical word for it. But if you imagine, you you have children, right? Mm -hmm. So you think about a baby that is, um, you know, starting to kind of come online in the sense of, I forget exactly at what month range this happens, but there's, you know, they go from sleeping all the time to suddenly like, oh, oh there are oh, yeah. people I there. remember it well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say she's do. waking up. Yeah. 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 It really does feel like that, right? And unfolding. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm sure you know, as a parent, that experience of having a baby look at you and it, it it's, I mean, we, we're such amazing animals. Babies will pull for something specific from people, right? Which is the desire to sort of look back and mimic facial expression. And you can stick your tongue out and they'll stick their tongue out too. And you have to imagine what happens to a baby that never gets that, Mm, right? The lack of attachment, neglect. Attachment, attunement, like all of these things. There's this really complex dance Mm. that happens between people, between babies and their caregivers that really sets us up in life for Mm. any number of things, right? Are we going to experience the world as inherently trustworthy or not trustworthy? Do we, you know, do we believe that um, if we need something, someone else is going to be there to give it to us? You know, Mm. there's just this dance of human behavior, which we see continue on in the life cycle to the point that when two adults are having a really good conversation with each other, the same process is happening, mm. right? You know, that unbeknownst to me and you, like luckily we don't have to think about this stuff consciously, but you get into a conversation with somebody and oxytocin is flowing in the brain and you know, all of these really healthy psychological processes are happening when we're engaged in a really good conversation with somebody. So to answer your question, in order to be a good therapist, Ultimately, a lot of training goes into it. Mm. But if I were to really say what I really think is happening, what are the ingredients that work in a good therapy? It's actually just having someone that will sit and listen and be available, truly available, right? Curious about you, sincerely curious, you know, um, and available to, to listen and to understand you in a way that I think not many people feel understood these is, days. Is that attunement? As it's an part adult? of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's oh, adult yeah. attunement. Totally. Yeah. You know, okay, there's so, oh my God, there's so much there. So, so, so this idea of the unfolding of the human being, yeah. to me, we see the neural correlates of that. So you mentioned oxytocin. You, you know, we can look at brain wiring. We can do fMRI. Mm-hmm. To me, and again, I'm an outlier on this. I think we have it all inverted. We've been duped by our senses into thinking that this is this brain, this goo is generating, mm. you know, all this stuff. I think what we're seeing is we're seeing a correlation. So when I have an experience of joy, 
we see this molecule oxytocin that we can measure and it's this sure. icon we can measure, but sure, sure. it's not causative of anything. In other words- Oh, absolutely. That's part of the depression problem, right? You know, people don't feel depressed because there's less serotonin in their brain. You just have less serotonin in your brain because you're depressed. Exactly. Most of the time. Right. Most of the time. Right. Not all of so the maybe time. there are some variants where it is actually a problem sure. chemically. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to entertain that as an right. idea. Right. I mean, to, to be completely honest with you, you know, I've been in this field for a long time. I've never worked with somebody that I thought was experiencing something like depression solely because their serotonin levels were low. Yeah. I just have never. And it doesn't mean that if someone isn't helped by it. Mm. I just don't. I'm. I'm. Mm. I just have that, never that, met someone or worked with someone where I thought that that was the core issue they were struggling with. So, so, so th there was a period in my medical training when I was a reductionist like that. So I thought, oh, this is all explicable. We're robots, complex robots wow. that are run by chemicals. And that's the nature of our conditioning in medical school. And yeah. what's interesting is I even read a book um, uh, by Kurt Vonnegut called Breakfast of Champions. Mm. And that book is interesting. It's a short book. And in it, the, the protagonist has mental illness. His mother has mental illness. And the way that the book describes him is as this malfunctioning, he sees the world as a series of malfunctioning robots with chemical transmitters that are malfunctioning. And as such, he's the only conscious entity. And he goes around treating others as if they are these robots. And it leads to destruction and chaos. And I remember thinking, that's what started to wake me up and go, you know, that's not what we are. Like we're we, there's something much more complex, and maybe it's explicable through chemical means if we were smart enough to know what they were, but our current understanding is not that. But now I'm actually even beyond that. I think it's actually, these. this is, um, what we are are these complex sort of storms of consciousness interacting yeah. in a subconscious all the way up to what we're aware of, nested, that comes not just from our genetics, but whatever lineage has given birth to us that unfolds through an interaction between what we're born with and what we're exposed to that then leads to complex dysfunction when it doesn't work right. I think it would have been very funny. I wish that we lived in a universe where we could take you in med med medical school and me in like let's say undergraduate undergraduate psychology school and have those two people have a conversation oh. because I was more, you know, there was a period of time where I worked as a mental health worker um, at a psychiatric hospital and I was more in this space of sort of being like, well, people say that if you have schizophrenia, you know, if you're having auditory hallucinations, you hear something that isn't there. Like, who are we to say it's not there? Like, maybe they just can hear something we can't hear. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. What I came to realize is that it's just more complicated it's than more that complicated. because there's so much suffering. And like, I just, right. my brain got kind of reframed on that whole thing. It's not, we can ask each other or ourselves, whatever, all sorts of fancy questions about whether it's there or not there. It ultimately doesn't really matter. It's like... When people are, you know, feeling persecuted, it's the it's suffering. suffering. It's suffering. The, it's yeah, it's yeah. suffering. I think you nailed it with suffering. Yeah. yeah, suffering. You could you could you could talk about what is adaptive and what isn't for reproduction. So there are certain yeah. behaviors that are adaptive, and yeah. what's adaptive and non-adaptive for suffering. Well, it turns out American culture is wonderful at at adapting for helping us to be safe, to have lots of food, to. Uh, uh, have wonderful technology and it's absolutely maladaptive for suffering. And, and I, so I would well say, that. I would say it's absolutely one of the worst cultures that has ever existed in the history of mankind for happiness. Yes. And, and when you say culture, you mean specifically American culture? I mean, specifically Western American, and, you know, yeah, yeah, European yeah, yeah. to some degree, although Europeans <laughs> at least value tradition and family and connection and relationships. And yes, the I think land. there are important differences right. between American culture and European culture. Yes. So I just don't want to lump, every lump it all West together and even, you know, Canada and like, it's like, yeah, we even, don't want to necessarily lump the West all together. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. So so actually that's an interesting thing because we, we were talking about reducing, you know, the DSM, like, you know, oh, now we just assume that, oh, depression is an ED. Oh, this guy is ill because of depression is the cause. Right, exactly. Right? But it's really- He no, suffers no. from a condition known as depression. As depression. He was, yep. He was. And then you go right into the direct to consumer ad, right? If you suffer, or if you were a loved one, suffer from a condition known as depression, you could have relief. New risk, you know, serotonin receptor agonists uh, show, you know, placebo, this and that. Ask your doctor if you have problems with priapism or, you know. And, yes. And yeah. I mean, I'll jump in here really quickly with something, which is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this stuff. I think it's um, 
I'm sure you and I can both relate to the idea that it's really sensitive stuff to talk about in the sense that neither one of us wants to make someone feel. I'm sure there are people that are going to listen to this that are struggling with depression, that are maybe on an antidepressant, that have been led to believe that their depression is chemical. And a lot of times when people hear this for the first time, it's really disruptive, right? Mm. You, You and I might both get some hate mail, which is okay. One of the reasons why I'm still willing to have this conversation and to to go to the places that we're going to is because I don't think that that view is actually really that compassionate. I'm with you. I don't explain, I don't explain yeah, what, you mean. what I mean to say is that people need their suffering to be held with much more compassion than your brain is broken, right? There's actually really some interesting evidence. Some people who want to promote that idea that any mental health problem, anxiety, depression, I don't We could come up, I'm going to say this really quickly, that bipolar disorder appears to have more of a genetic loading and appears to be more, I wouldn't want to treat a bipolar person without making sure that that person was on a supportive medication. Exactly. So there there are, I mean, this is really complicated stuff because it's like exceptions to all of the rules. Right. It's actually one of the reasons why I don't want GPs to be writing psych scripts. It's like, it's complicated stuff. You could have a bipolar person in your office who shows up as depressed. You give them a prescription for Prozac and, and then it induces they're... a manic episode. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, we just, we've got to get these communities communicating more. But. And, and don't let me forget to come back to that because I want to, yeah. I want to say, well, okay, if they, if they can't do it, then who the hell is going to do it? Cause we don't have enough people and it's already a crisis. There's not enough people to listen, but go back to holding. Yeah. Suffering and, I'm not, yeah. I think I might disagree with that. Ah, okay. So we can circle back to that. Good, in good, a good, good, good. But I just think that people need their suffering to be held with more compassion than feeling like they're broken. And there's actually really interesting evidence. So some people who want to promote that view, a sort of biomedical cause of our suffering, tend to do so with really good, good intentions, intent. good intent. yeah. which is partially to destigmatize our mental health experiences, right? But interestingly, there actually is evidence that it doesn't work that way, that the the sort of broken brain hypothesis of mental health stuff doesn't actually increase or doesn't decrease stigma and it doesn't increase compassion or understanding. And meanwhile, if you think about it from a perspective of sort of attunement and attachment and what I think is happening when a good good therapy is working, It's partially because we feel as human beings a very deep desire to just feel understood, right? Like Mm. understood by anyone. Yeah. And I don't think that anybody really feels understood when they're, they go to their doctor and they say, I, I can't get out of bed. I feel like shit. And it's like, okay, here's a you know, prescription for Prozac without any referral for mental health follow-up care or any further questions. Meanwhile, the person's got, you know, a dying parent, an asshole boss. Like, you know what I mean? Like... And I hear this time and time again from patients. They just gave me a medication, but it, I didn't. I felt drugged, or I just yeah. I didn't feel like the root cause was addressed. And the truth is, that, so this thing about being witnessed in your suffering is yeah. so important. Yeah, so important. like I feel better just when you're listening to me go, "Hey, this is why I'm depressed," and I see your face, and I'm like, I detect that she actually understands what I'm saying. Totally. Now the second layer of that is, do I understand myself? Yes. So how how does therapy help with that? Because I think a lot of times we're in deep coping mechanisms to deny the truth about things like i had to come to terms with the fact that you know part of the reason i'm unhappy is i don't like feeling like i'm part of the problem like i don't want to go out and like speak for organizations that aren't making things better so that they can make their providers feel like they got a burnout guy or you know that that maybe i am a little uh like i have a lot of self-worth issues so when i put out a video and it doesn't get the engagement that i think i felt i put into it i feel like lessened and and devalued and now i'm obsessed with how many clicks i'm getting and how many likes i'm getting which is the fundamental pathology of all social media as it is but it takes me a while to sort that out and i have help from a lot of friends who are like you know what it is it's this because i can't see it how how does therapy help with that well so uh, a couple of ways but i think most fundamentally especially in the context of therapy, the reason why it's so valuable to be understood by another person is so that we can understand ourselves, right? Mm. It's not really, I mean, when you think about it, even when a really good therapy ends, if it didn't matter whether or not you understood yourself, theoretically all of that understanding would be left with somebody that you may never see again, right? Mm. Like it's not really important so much whether your therapist understands you. I think the point is that your therapist helps you understand yourself. Uh Aha. 
that makes perfect sense. You know, they that, use their training, their wisdom, their, you know, whatever to help you understand yourself. That, 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 that makes perfect sense. Cause yeah. I've had people, one of the, mo- one of the more transformative experiences of my life was there was this, uh, I've told this story before and actually I want to ask you at some point about psychedelics and sure. your experience in that space being in San Francisco. I'm sure. sure. So uh, 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 this was years ago. I just moved to Las Vegas. I was uh, totally off my bearings. I was conditioned medical person from Stanford. And now I have an open slate, do what you like to do to transform things and, but make it something that you're passionate about. That was the offer I was given. It's crazy. Tony yeah. Shea from Zappos, who totally. gets that? And yeah. again, that, that, that feeds back into, and I'm such a piece of shit for complaining about anything. Like who gets to do this? Right. But and so, yet sometimes when people are given almost that much free reign and space to dream it can create almost a little bit of a collapsing in on oneself because it's almost like too much that's right? what it, that's what it felt like yeah like now it's on me to do something and i i don't i don't have it in me i don't know what it is yeah. and, and so i had i had an experience with a with a woman who uh she she was formerly worked for like a fashion designer was like a really high-powered fashion person hung out with started hanging out with tony smoked a lot of weed like that was her thing i think that was for her own anxiety and how she did but also people was people sometimes self-medicate self-medicate yeah. self-medicate so bikram yoga was her thing and she was very spiritual like in a way that i i didn't encounter because i was an atheist hardcore and didn't understand spirituality at all mm-hmm. and i uh, thought it was all a bunch of crock of crap and so it was about science woman like that's what it's about it's a reductionism like it's to a, me spirituality is science but it's a different kind of science and that's what i've come to yeah yeah. And actually, it's a different kind That's, of science. That, but was, that was the taco it's science, conversation. That was the now taco we're coming full circle to exactly, tacos. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And she was the one who started to actually open my mind to that, which was, uh, you know, she basically took me to go shopping for clothes because I did not address myself. And, and she was like, this is it. And I was like, well, so after that, we go back at Tony's place. And she's like, I'm going to smoke some weed. Do you want some? And I'm like, oh, I haven't smoked in years. Let's, you know. So I take one puff off this thing. Mm-hmm. I am high as I've ever been in my life. I'm just out of my mind. Okay. And at this point, she really goes, well, so I've been kind of, I've been trying to understand you. And this is what I see. I see this and 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 this while you were high And I'm high as, I'm just like, and I'm starting to get vaguely paranoid, but then I start to listen and then I start to realize, oh my God. She actually really does understand me in a way that I don't think I understand myself. And she's like, you moved because of this. You're this type of person. You have it in you to do this. Why are you denying that? This is your wife and kids. This is what they're about. This is your relationship with them. I've spent some time with you. This is why this and this and this and this. And like, does this feel right to you? And I'm like sitting there going, oh my God. <laughs> like, yeah, wow. Initially it felt like an attack on my ego. Yeah, it's all feeling a bit invasive on my end. Super yeah, invasive. Yeah, yeah. But then by the end of the evening, and this was ours, I was like, I had never felt that degree of relief wow. at being understood and, and helping seen. and seeing it clearly. Yeah. And she was one of these spirituality types who was like, it's only the present moment. Totally. Like there's nothing She's else. Like, My third eye is open. That's man. right, man. I the see shop. you so clearly. Exactly. Whereas <laughs> yeah. I'm going, this is nuts. But at the same time, there really is only the present moment. And actually, right. meditation may be a path to this instead of getting really high. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. uh, you know, because that's not for me, right? Yeah. And um, and so on and so forth. And so uh, that for me was a transformative experience that set me on a path to letting go a lot of the preconceived notions about who oh, I was. Oh, how cool! A little bit of ego dissolution, a little bit of better connection with family and friends, and it lasted for a long time but then new ego structure laced that pot I like, like what was it wonder because <laughs> yeah. i mean i've done psychedelics in college yeah. and i never had that kind of experience as i had that day and i think mm-hmm. it was the combination of guide yeah therapist yeah and set and setting and being in a place in my life where that i needed to hear yeah them. yeah you needed a little bit of guidance exactly yeah. so what are your thoughts on like psychedelic guidance because now that's becoming back and you know michael yeah. pollan's how to change your mm-hmm. mind and other books I am truly not an expert, to be honest with right. you. I'm not, I'm not the, um, I don't have any um, prejudice against it as an approach. Um, some people really value that path and get a lot out of it. And I don't chagrin those people anything, but it's not my jam. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, I don't know. You know what I think is interesting about it? I don't mm-hmm. think it's the chemical. Like, yeah. let's say it's psilocybin high dose or it's DMT. It's not the chemical. I think it's the mind state that people get put in that then allows them to confront and be heard and understood even on their own 
on their own terms. And that self-compassion piece that you yeah. started the show talking about that I wanted to come back to. This idea that we don't forgive ourselves for these things. We don't hold ourselves uh, with love. Mm -hmm. We don't feel that we're you know worthy of this. And, and that lack of self-compassion projects into the world as yeah. as a kind of a you put up defenses and you, you try to protect this little fragility that you feel isn't worth protecting and it's very tough so well put i think there are paths to finding that whether it's therapy whether it's meditation so meditation and compassion yeah for I'm, I'm a big yeah med, yeah yeah med, i think a lot of what i have gotten through meditation specifically i think other people get through hallucinogens right um i've been meditating for a long time and have experimented with a lot of different types of meditation but oh. it's interesting because if you actually look at the um the science of psychedelics uh i know a little bit about this because i know um some people that are into it, and I recently read a journal article that I wouldn't recommend anyone check out. It was a slog. But it's actually really interesting to see that different types of psychedelic drugs impact different parts of the brain depending on what their chemical makeup is. Right. So there is some evidence, you know, in the same way that we're talking about how, you know, depression isn't caused by a Prozac deficiency. It's funny how you can sort of hit certain but buttons in the brain given, you know, whether if you kick the dopamine up to 11 or if you kick the serotonin up to 11 you know you're going to have different types of experiences depending on what the, what the formulation of the drugs are right so a lot of people will you know suddenly be i think the experiences a lot of people describe it's actually not that i've never done hallucinogens i just i was in college and it was not therapeutic yeah, exactly you know, so i'm not gonna that was my <laughs> that was my experience with yeah, hallucinogens. exactly yeah. like i'm not gonna yeah. sit here talk, talking as if i'm some expert in hallucinogens from a psychotherapeutic standpoint but um the, the sense that i get from people that i've talked to that are really into those things is that some of what you can spend, you know, years in therapy getting, you can sort of, and a lot of it is just consciousness. It's yeah. like if your consciousness has been kind of collapsed, right? Uh, Contracted. An old, yeah. an old therapist said just was a, one brilliant line to me once, and it was in reference to depression, and it was how self-aware um, to a fault people can become when they're depressed. Yeah. Um, actually really interesting. I'm going to interrupt myself to say something. They did this research study where they said, what is the, you know, those word graphs where it says like if um, the number one word you sort of hear most, if you were to like diagram a conversation, word clouds, yeah, word clouds, yeah. Um, that the number one word that you hear most out of people who are clinically depressed is I like uh, I am suffering. I feel there's a lot of I statements. Oh, wow. And it's not that it's narcissism per se. No, 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 no. It's all. the opposite. Yeah. No, it's it's in many ways the opposite. Yeah. But there's a there's a level of suffering that sometimes can kind of become overly self-identified. And this therapist said to me once, if you hit your thumb with a hammer, all you can think of is your thumb. Right. right? Like when someone right. is said they tend to be people when they're really suffering tend to be somewhat collapsed in on their suffering. And I think one of the things that psychedelics can give people is an expanded sense of consciousness where it's like, you know, all of a sudden you realize the universe is so much bigger than that. you as one person. So if people, you know, want to hit a button and have that experience, I say, go for go it. Go for it yeah. with a guide. With a guide. With a guide. Because I think that, with again, a guide. With a guide. otherwise you don't integrate the experience in a meaningful way. There's a lot that you said there that I'm fascinated with. One is this contraction mm -hmm. uh, to the self. Yeah. And one of the mechanisms that psychedelics works, one of the me mechanisms that meditation works, and they've looked at Buddhist monks who are adept compassion meditators, they're able to silence their default mode network in their brain that generates the sense of self. Yeah. And what we have to remember that people don't, they don't think about this. It's not something we think about every day. It turns out I think about it every day because yeah, I'm fascinated. Yeah, right? yeah, you and I are weird. We're so we weird that way. That's why day, we were yeah. having those tacos. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I got to have you on the show, girl, because this is the thing. I'm like, I'm there. Yeah, yeah. exactly, right? Whereas everyone else at the table is like, ah, uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Staring at their phones. Oh, yeah. I had this conversation the other night, actually. And yeah. like the dean of Stanford Medical School was there and some other real bigwigs were there. And I'm like, okay, guys, so this is the nature of consciousness and how. And they, I would just eyes glazed over uh, queerical looks and then move on to like the next course of the meal. And I, I was just like, "Ooh, I don't feel understood oh, here." But but no. it was but it was okay. I wish I had been there. It was okay because again, <laughs> yeah. there is a, a appropriate reductionism in science. So th th this idea that by silencing, so the self is a creation that's created moment to moment by our minds. It's not a fundamental reality in our brain. In it other would words, appear that it, it isn't. It yeah. would appear that it isn't. When you ex inspect it, there's no person behind your eyes. 
sitting there making decisions and pulling the string, the I that the depressed person refers to. Right. This is a construction of our mind system that allows us to interact with a world that allows us to survive, that allows us to protect our family and ourselves and to mm -hmm. maintain an ego and integrity that yes. lets us It work. allows us to function, right? It would be pretty hard to function in the world if you didn't have an integrated sense of self. Exactly. Yeah. You'd be like you know, Ramana Maharshi who lost his sense of self through meditation and had an enlightenment experience and sits in a cave and people come to him and he's like, everything is consciousness. It's like, well, you're not getting laid. You're not going to eat, <laughs> but people... I was just about to say, I hope someone loves him enough to bring him snacks. And they did. <laughs> yeah, totally. They, did. Good, they yeah. did. Someone had to turn him because he would get sores from sitting oh, with him. Oh, jeez. But this yeah, guy was yeah. woke. Mm -hmm. So he understood the nature of consciousness, which is everything arises moment to moment. Now, the self itself, when over-centered in us, and I think that's American culture, that's part of it, is we're all about consumer culture, we're about material acquisition, we're about achievement, we're about have a bigger house than our neighbor. Neighbors. Yeah. And I think what happens then is it deifies the self that is as it is a, a, con a construct. And when that thing becomes deified, then if it, things don't go right, which they always won't, right. there's no life where things go right all the time. Yeah. We bring that self as the I, we focus on it, we deify it, and it's the center of our suffering. And Absolutely. Do you and the more or? identified we are with that and the more identified we are with the idea that those material possessions are going to give us happiness mm. or bring us happiness, whatever, the more likely that it is to not work. Yeah. It's a, it's a hedonic treadmill. If I just get the 77 inch OLED TV, which yeah. you saw in my living room, <laughs> I will find peace. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right? And you know what's funny? Oh, this is an interesting dumb story. So I bought this 77 inch TV that I've been coveting for like three years. Like the technology came out. I'm like, I love TV. I love the concept of TV. Mm -hmm. I don't like sitting and watching TV. I love the technology of it. Right? That's it's so like funny. Nerdy thing. <laughs> Perfect black levels and great colors. Oh, men and, and their televisions. Men and their televisions. Right. So I get the TV. I put it on the thing. I'm watching it. I'm like, this is the best TV I've ever seen in my life. I had a burst of dopamine. I was happy. Mm. And then I was like, but it's not quite centered. But maybe it needs to be calibrated. But maybe I should have gotten a 90-inch TV. But miserable, yeah. anxious, just full of contraction and I, I, I. Like, yeah. I should have, I should have. I. And you know what happened the other day? Dr. Harry, who's a good friend, and his family came over. We had this new couch and this TV. And they go, oh, cool TV, man. Let's watch something. And we put on uh, What We Do in the Shadows, which is a vampire movie. It's crazy. Okay. It's funny. It's by the guys who did Flight of the Concords. Oh, cool. And the whole family's sitting there. It's not a family movie, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Rated R. And we're all watching it and laughing and connecting. And there's this triad between the TV and these human beings who are then connecting with each other and laughing and sharing this moment. And I felt happy truly happy like yeah. i was like this because of the people the people yeah. and this yeah. is what we need to bring america back like guys yes. our communities and sense our people of community. sense of community mm -hmm. reduce the isolation and then look you can use drugs for severe mental illness as an adjunct but if we're not talking about the root causes if we're not exchanging conscious experience is not going to help. Can I bring us in a slightly different direction that I think you're going to think is interesting? Yeah. Can we talk about gun violence for a moment? Oh dear God! Do you, you're trying gonna, to get me murdered. Gonna... <laughs> so I did. I did a. I did a show about this okay. actually. So yeah. Tell me. Tell okay. me. Tell me about gun violence. Well, I'm just so. You know, I live in San Francisco. People can guess about my politics. Right. I, I want to have a conversation that's not about the guns, but about the psychology that goes into mass violence. Okay. And I just think that it is. Um, there is a cultural syndrome that we are experiencing that as a re is a result of the loneliness that you just sort of skipped across when you were, you know, just sort of saying like, I want to bring America back to this place of having community, right? Yeah. Make that America sense of communal again. <laughs> make America communal <laughs> but again. But not in a communist way. In no, let's like stitch it onto a pillow. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I just think that... Um, to me, to talk about that, it's really in keeping with everything that we're talking about only because, so there's actually really interesting evidence. Again, icons, right? I don't know that people are not going to know what we mean when we talk about icons. We're going to have to tell them about yeah, Donald you, Hoffman oh, if no, anyone that, didn't hear that episode. They know I'm ranting and raving about Donald Hoffman all the time. Okay, he's okay, coming, okay. He's coming back in November, by the way. Okay. He's going to be on the show. Anyways, that's another talk. Okay, I'm okay. just going to like, I'm going to sit just on that would you, stool over there. Would you come? That'd be watch. great if you could throw would, some questions I would really, I would really love great. that. Yeah. Okay. But I just don't want to be referencing something that we haven't talked about in this right. episode. Right, right. But yeah, I'm sure people know we're Donald Hoffman fans. Okay, yeah. so 
again, icons, the brain, whatever, we'll take it all with a grain of salt, but there is evidence that when people experience chronic loneliness and isolation, there's less activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is usually the part that would provide some breaks. The breaks, yeah. The breaks on things. It's what I lack. <laughs> <laughs> Not entirely, luckily. But... Um, and there's more activity in the amygdala, which is the part that's responsible for fear and aggression. Mm. And I just think that we're never going to solve this problem by looking at guns alone. Like it's, this is a, a, a fabric of our nation issue that people are too isolated. You know, Leslie Carr, what kind of sad, bleeding ass liberal are you if you don't say make something, it about the guns. if you say something nuanced like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because honestly, honestly, this has been this has been the central piece that I think we should be talking about with guns. There are 300 million guns in the in the country. Yeah. It is very, or maybe even more. There's more than there are people, all right? And so the question of like just getting them off the streets, it that that's not it's not you can't do that. And there are 3 million people for whom guns is the it's the most important thing in their lives, whether they're sportsmen or whether they yeah. just care about, they have liberty versus oppression as a major moral palette, okay? But let's look at, and it's not sort of the far right that's saying, oh, it's all mental illness and these are just crazy people mm -hmm. and that are, it's guns don't kill people, people kill people. It is a combination of the social fabric of loneliness, yes. creating, these are actually, the data shows these people are not necessarily psychiatrically ill in a DSM way. Not all of them. Yeah. Right? I, uh, I, uh, tell me, tell me. Can I say what I think please, about that please, really please, quickly? Please, please. I think that it is really, really tricky because I think that a lot of well-intentioned people say that because they don't want to conflate that kind of mental illness. With violence. With, well, um, so meaning this kind of mental illness, like the kind of person that would commit that kind of crime with any other type of mentally ill person, which is to say people who are depressed, anxious, people with schizophrenia. Just because you have like, let's say something like schiz schizophrenia, schizophrenic people are generally like less violent than other people, right? So what, they, what they're trying to do is mm. people are overcorrecting. I see. They're saying that it's not that mentally ill people commit these kinds of crimes the dilemma i think is that it's just it's really distorted because mentally healthy people don't shoot up schools uh, so, so, so you know what i mean like the the diagnosis that often is most appropriate is like antisocial personality there we disorder go, there we go. So, so it's so it's it's well-intentioned right, right, right. really distorted okay so it's more but so i guess what i'm i totally get that I guess what I'm saying is it's not like someone with like schizophrenia necessarily. It's someone with maybe the personality disorder. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that it's that some, was the sense that I got clearly from wrong, you something's, know, something's wrong with clearly them, really wrong. But it's not, it's not a simple, like it's what they used to call axis two, right? Like personality disorder. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I was, yes. And I'm sort of thinking like, yeah, it's just really complicated. It's complicated. kind of not some of the classic things that we think of when we think of mental illness. Like there's nothing about being bipolar that makes you more likely to commit a crime. Exactly. And you're not more likely to shoot up a school because exactly. you have bipolar disorder. Yeah. It's more like antisocial personality disorder. Again, we don't say axis two anymore but right. you could have before um it's just things are constantly evolving um well, you just, so, but so, it's but yeah i think all what i'm really trying to draw our attention to here is the idea that you know yeah okay guns don't kill people people kill people well okay it's both right <laughs> it's people with guns right and if we're gonna talk about this even through a framework of mental health i think we have to acknowledge why this has skyrocketed over the course of the past like what would you say yeah 10 couple, years, 20 years 20 yeah. years 10 to 20 so, so years wh why is that because I think that the world that we live in is changing. I think people are more stressed than they've ever been before. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, you look at the trajectory of things like CEO pay versus worker pay, just meaning, and I, I know that might sound kind of outlandish, but I'm just talking about these trends right. of the world is getting harder. Or I should say life in America is getting harder for the average person yeah and if it's getting harder for the average person it's really getting hard for people in the, in the margins yeah and so so what we're seeing now is a manifestation of a cultural phenomenon a social phenomenon where stress anxiety loneliness disconnection is manifesting in the extremes as yeah. gun violence yeah knife violence so in, in i forget where it was in paris there was just a knife attack mm. uh and you can kill four or five people with a knife of course you can kill a lot more people with a gun right but the idea and was that 
not ideologically motivated that attack i, I, I didn't hear anything i don't about know that i don't know okay, but i'll okay. tell you like even the people who are ideologically motivated isn't that a form of dysfunctional disconnection oh 100 yeah. percent. like yeah. the guys who who flew the planes into uh you know they were ideologues but there was something very wrong with them 100 percent. Yeah. yeah and and again and also like not a chemical imbalance right like right. something happened right something happened something to them. Ha- something happened to those men right I think we, I, I, yeah i think we need to be able to have yeah. candid conversations about that kind of thing yeah, but but oh my gosh be careful God forbid, be I careful again, are you normalizing this you know uh, yeah. uh, 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 criminal behavior and, and the other the other piece of that is we should be asking not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Like, what was Precisely. it? Precisely. In this evolution Precisely. of a human being. Precisely, yeah. That you are now in this space. And One, you know what? Mm-hmm. That should be destigmatizing. It shouldn't, that should be destigmatizing. Yeah. It should say, listen, there's a lot of stuff that's out of our control. Mm-hmm. But now in this present moment, yeah. that we understand that, yeah. it is in your control to do something. I think that compassionate curiosity has the power to be profoundly transformative Mm. and i think that we need basically 100 percent more of it in the world that we live in you know one person's right to throw a punch extends as far as the beginning of someone else's face right so it's not it's never to excuse violence someone could tell me someone could give me you know a psychological report on all of the terrorists and tell me every terrible thing that ever happened to them Mm. they were molested all of the terrible things that Mm. made them think that what they were doing was right and it wouldn't make me it wouldn't excuse it in my exactly mind exactly right so it's not a matter of making excuses for people right but would we look at the whole situation differently if we right. could sort of say like what was this what was, what were these people's unique factors right that, and, and that made them think that that was the right thing to do and it means that we should let go of things like vengeance and retribution uh and in favor of okay this was a terrible thing this person did there's all yeah. kinds of reasons how are we going to prevent this from happening mm-hmm. and keep this person from harming anybody? 100%. That, that should be it. And are they are they somebody who is rehabable? Well, then we should do that. If they're not, then we need to figure out a way to keep society and the masses safe yeah. from this person who maybe maybe yeah. they're a true psychopath and they don't have any sense of you know correctness and put out back on the street they will molest someone or they'll do something well then we need a absolutely if right. someone needs to be sort of protected from harming other people that's one thing right but just as a quick something that we'll throw in here to um, boost your point basically is that it's interesting how studies show that when the death penalty we've had instances over time where the death penalty is um, taken away and then reinstated yeah and you can see that when states don't have the death penalty there's less violent crime and when the death penalty is reinstated violent crimes go back up yeah and the thinking the theory is that part of the reason why is because the state is sanctioning that kind of violence right like how do you say that killing is bad if the punishment for killing is killing sort of Hammurabi's code style right, right, right? you know right. like it's it's hard to reinforce the message that murder is wrong right so, so if so, the punishment for murder is murder so so did we get it backwards so you were saying like when there was no death penalty violent crime was less or more when there's no death penalty, violent crime goes down. Oh, okay, that was, I think. Oh, we, did, I, we did I reverse it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then I, and was I, I when it. it's yeah. reinstated, it yeah. goes back up. And it's it said, again, I think that there's maybe a million explanations for that, but the bottom line, and maybe that's a valid one, I think the bottom line is, well, we just got to do what actually works. Yeah. Now, death penalty feels good to a lot of people. That's yeah. the thing. We're Retribution emotional. Retribution feels good. Retribution feels great. Tickles the amygdala. It really does. Yeah. And I think it comes from our tribal days when somebody's not, holding their water they're not they're not contributing to the tribe so there's a fairness thing that's almost inborn and actually john height's work and others have looked at infants they have morality built in there's Mm. a there's a component of being able to tease out we're moral creatures by definition and then it's just codified and solidified over our evolution and and it makes sense because we're tribal creatures we need to get along we need to have a sense of eye for an eye or whether or it's golden rule Right. Right? Yeah. Like, hey, you help me, I'll help you. Exactly. And that's partially, there's some theories that we evolved a big neocortex to be able to keep track of debts and relationships. Wow, that's really cool. I've never heard that. Yeah. So that, you know, we can hold about 150 people in our memory in terms of what we owe them, who they are, who are their kids, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Not much more than that. And that's why I think a lot of people get stage fright in rooms bigger than that. A lot of people get, uh, because now, wait, wait, I don't know (laughs) what's going on here. There's a lot of interesting psychodynamics around that. But again, it's speculation. And at that point, yeah. it's just fun to speculate. It is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think to me, the bottom line is that it's it's amazing how much 
um, being curious and having compassionate curiosity heals as opposed to just punishing. It gets to, 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 we live in a sort of punitive world. Don't we, we do. And actually what you said about compassionate curiosity, can you elaborate more as a therapist? How do you maintain the energy to show compassionate curiosity? Now, and I want to distinguish this from straight empathy, empathy where affective empathy, where you're taking someone's pain as your own mm -hmm. and feeling it and then acting from it, which mm -hmm. I feel is personally, I feel is very, and Paul Bloom and others have written about this. It's, it's harmful because empathy is a, it can be, yeah. it can be. Mm -hmm. empathy is a spotlight. It only shines on one individual. It's very hard to empathize with a people. It's very hard to empathize with a statistic, but you, I can empathize with you, which is why charities love to show an individual child. You can help this child yeah, they absolutely. don't show a mass of people starving yeah. to death. and and whereas compassion is love concern and understanding in the face of suffering and mm -hmm. a desire to make it better but not necessarily taking the suffering and holding sure it. so compassionate curiosity how do you think about that in your practice and how do you sustain it when many people would say well that's going to burn you out it's so interesting i guess for me the emphasis is on the curiosity which I don't find depleting. Yeah. Yeah, I don't feel like I need to protect my energy if my primary mode of being is just to feel curious. Ah, so th that's very powerful because you can tell nurses on the front lines in the ER who are seeing someone who's with drug addiction, who's yeah. struggling, and they have some transference and some countertransference, sure. whatever, but they also have the desire to alleviate the suffering because they feel that pain and they go, ooh, ooh, let's just give them a little bit of morphine and they'll calm down. And maybe that's not compassion. Compassion might be a broader, like, oh, I understand what's going on here. The compassionate thing is to, is to get them through the detox, get them into therapy, have difficult conversations. Yeah, I mean, perhaps this is an appropriate time to talk about codependency, right? Because oh, yeah. a lot Tell of the people that. That, that listen to your show are nurses and healthcare providers, right? I mean, I think that there's, um, sometimes I think when people are operating from kind of a codependent place, that's when things can feel a little bit more depleting because it feels like it's your job to fix, you know, that the fixing becomes on the job of the healer. Yes. Right now, granted, the work that I do is very different than the work that a nurse does. I can afford to be curious because it sort of is the nature of my work to be curious. Right. If it's your job to take care of someone else's um, literal health care in kind of a physical sense, there may just be. Um, I mean, I think curiosity is always a good thing, but there, it just may be a little bit less relevant. Mm. Um, but I. I think we all have to respect another person's journey, right? That we can kind of do our best to help them, but it can't be our job to fix them. Yes. Yes. A thousand. You know, percent. I mean, I think when people come to see me as a therapist, I don't think that I fix them. Mm. I think that in my presence, they fix themselves. Exactly. Exactly right. And like I think they wouldn't be there if they weren't ready to do that work. They wouldn't. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I get messages from frontline healthcare people, doctors, nurses, therapists, respiratory therapists, dietitians, yeah. who say, I feel powerless mm -hmm. in the face of what I see to do anything that helps these people. Right. And I tell them that's not true because you're, if you're present with them, if you hold their suffering, in other words, you, ex you understand their suffering, you witness it, and, and again, it's, it is a curiosity, I've never put it in those words, mm. it's a curiosity about caring about what their experience is, mm -hmm. and then doing your best, being competent at your job, yeah. caring about your job, and doing your best to help them, you've done a wonderful thing, even if you can't, because it causes moral injury, it causes moral, moral distress yeah. when we feel like we cannot help somebody because of a failure on our part. And yeah. I think that's very hard on ourselves. And again, self-compassion is the hardest thing to do. So telling, you know, especially nurses, because they're very hard on themselves, man. It, 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 they, they don't do self-care. They really, really, really uh, um, pile it on themselves terribly. Yeah, there's a lot of caretaking that goes into that profession mm. at kind of a, um, at the level of almost personality, just meaning that a lot of it is... Um, I don't want to make sweeping statements because I think people can go into different professions for all sorts of reasons, but I think a lot of people become nurses because they were raised to be caretakers and raised to think that taking care of somebody else was their job, their responsibility. And so I think a lot of that impulse to really take it on is um, actually goes back to something that's very old oftentimes. 
Mm. You know, uh, the last time we met was at the podcast at Beta Brand headquarters in San Francisco, and you were in the audience, and we were talking about this online personality test, the Sparkotype. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you were, were laughing. Me up and you're at like, that. Come on, and I'm like, I'm gonna harass this practicing psychologist with this dime store <laughs> psychology. And what's interesting is I had a bunch of a bunch of the supporters who are nurses yeah. took the test because mm-hmm. it's free, and um, they almost to a one, their top Sparkotype was nurturer out of the 10. Yeah. So it makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I think there's a degree of aptitude and some of it's con- conditioned by our experience, but some of it is just, we're just kind of born with these certain, but you, you, you yourself are an advocate of things change over time. Our personalities evolve and they can be dramatically different. Oh yeah. 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 You know, I, I would be curious to see what would happen for some, ther- for some nurses if they went into therapy and just felt like they were also being seen and also being supported. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, Sometimes people who do a lot of supporting also just need support. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He, he, we had a therapist, uh, Nina, at our uh, clinic, uh, licensed clinical social worker uh, therapist, and she was booked solid. Yeah. And these were young, relatively healthy people. And right. And just the degree of unhappiness. Now, yeah. and, and bringing that to the Bay Area. So I have, Ron Sena and I were sitting right here where you're sitting. He was sitting there, and we were talking about the general misery of the Bay Area. and. Yeah, I was so struck by that part yeah. of that interview. Yeah, yeah and it's in, I'd be curious what you think, but I, we ourselves in the medical space, uh, in the straight medical, like not, you know, and you're in the medical space as well, but in the like, okay, super achievement minded, like doctors, type A Indians, we were like, this place is a den of misery. And what you said about your own clientele being very privileged, but still suffering, he says the same thing. So his right. clientele are executives, tech leaders, entrepreneurs. And they, I had a feeling listening to him, I was like, yeah, there's a lot of overlap. There's there. a lot yeah. of overlap. Yeah. Actually, you guys would probably be good referral source for each That's other. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah. I'll, con- I'll connect you. Cool. Because, because they, what happens then it manifests physically and then when you get to the root of it in the room with the family there, you realize, no, it's this person has been burning the candle at both ends, has been in this achievement mindset. And the Bay Area thrives on it, feeds on that. And everything from the real estate market to the startup mm-hmm. mentality. To, I was at the medical school at Stanford talking, doing a seminar for the med students. And these kids were like, they were anxious, man. Like it's like, yeah. it's a pressure cooker. Yeah. And do you encounter that? either in your clients or in your own life in the Bay? Is there something special about the Bay or is this just America? Well, I don't wouldn't necessarily say that it's just America entirely. I do think that we're in a little microcosm here, which is different from other parts of the world. I, know, I was really struck by that part of the interview only because I'm aware that what you two were talking about is here. But um, it's funny because the Bay Area is so multifaceted to me in the sense that there's a lot of stress and overachievement and mm. then also like a lot of yoga. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. So we're kind of weird yeah. here that way. Yeah. And I think in my personal life, I tend to gravitate more towards the yoga. Yeah. So I didn't necessarily feel like I was personally relating to that as much, although I do see it in a lot of my um, patients, clients, whatever you want to call them. I kind of, I just like both of those words, the people that I work with. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that um, I think that he really hit the nail on the head when he was saying that people come to the Bay Area because they have big dreams and yeah. they want, you know, people this a lot. The people who gravitate towards this part of the world tend to be highly motivated and um, that can create its own cluster mm. of syndromes. Selection right? bias. Yeah. I think especially mm. when people really get into comparison mode and, you know, am I doing as well as the next person and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, you know, so America's a really big country. I know I'm stating the obvious, but I actually think it's interesting. It, it can be important for us to keep that in mind sometimes mm. that, that it's that, um, culturally speaking mm. we may be a monolithic nation but culturally speaking there is a tremendous amount of diversity here depending on what part of the country you're in a, a thousand you know, percent that, and and one, one one of the great joys i have is actually getting to travel around the country and do these little shows and things it's and wild isn't it's it wild. just to like, see that yeah Lubbock, you, it's, texas it's, yeah you have to be careful new york make... city yeah uh, uh boise idaho yeah like, and then barcelona spain And you see a variance that's way, way across a couple standard deviations. Yeah. And then Vegas, where I was for so many years, is like this open slate. And it's a mix of people that are slackers and people who are there to reinvent themselves and people who are there that... And it's a purple state. So politically, 
uh, you, you see the whole spectrum of stuff. It was really fascinating. And I came back to the Bay with an achievement mindset. I self-selected. Right. I was like, yeah. you know, my wife wants her job back. I want to take this thing to the next level. So I'm going to have better guests like Leslie Carr. I'm going to have, you know, it's just going to be this thing and I'm going to take this show and we're going to change the world. And then I get here and I'm like, wow, it's really back into this comparison mindset and the stress of material mindset and the, the, the sitting in traffic mindset. And, and yet I've had beautiful awake experiences during meditation here, during bike rides here, during walking in nature here, during reconnecting with my friends here. So again, you hold this paradox. You're right. There's a wokeness mixed with a striving brokenness. And this is perhaps a really good time to say something that's important. I know we've been kind of all over the map with this conversation in wonderful ways, but so much of life has to do with what we pay attention to, right? Mm. What we choose to pay attention to and even on an unconscious level, what we don't, you know, what we don't necessarily consciously choose. We consciously and we unconsciously choose, right? Mm. But um there is always an opportunity once we notice that we're noticing something, if we don't like it, to try to notice something else. Ah, the cognitive behavioral sort of angle on yeah, it. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. If we want to yeah, use if it, we I, want to If we want to use that, yeah. If we, we want to use that it. phrase yeah. or whatever, yeah. Exactly. And um, it's really interesting because we are, we're, it's a um, very cool part of the world that we live in where there are strivers and there are achievers and there are people who are comparing themselves to one another in ways that I wish for their souls that they wouldn't, you know? <laughs> but we also are surrounded by beautiful hiking trails and a really woke kind of people who uh, practice Reiki sub subculture. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. I, exactly. It, if you want to get a little weird, it there's really, so much. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, like I've been connecting with some people, some doctors who are in the psychedelic medicine space. We're going to try to get them on the show if cool. they can, if they can tolerate the threat to their license. Oh, you know wow. what I mean? It's really interesting. And their God, credibility. Isn't that wild. It's really wild. Like, and uh, a, a lot of interesting stuff is happening here. But this idea of our attention, mm -hmm. I think attention is the center piece of either peace, contentment, allowing, or suffering. It really is. Because what we choose to pay attention to, and again, some of it just feels like it's not a choice. Some of it just bubbles up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a lot of choiceless awareness that happens. But, <laughs> yeah. But if we practice, we can actually move our attention in ways that are very, very, very useful. And that's what meditation Absolutely. is. Absolutely. That's what cognitive behavioral therapy is. That's what uh, a lot of the sages throughout time have said. You know, pay attention mm -hmm. to thoughts that promote happiness and relieve suffering and maybe let go of thoughts that don't. Mm -hmm. Now, it's easier said than done, but it can be done. And you know what I've been doing lately uh, that really I find is transformative? I've been doing it during this interview occasionally. Um, so This is exciting. Isn't that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's going to sound woo-woo and crazy, but it's a centerpiece of actually... Probably what, not to me, but Not driving, to you, for yeah. sure. But maybe to 30% of my audience. <laughs> so the, the idea that, you know, Sam Harris wrote about this in his book, Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion. Mm. And it, it's this idea that, uh, again, self is a bit of an illusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we can transiently realize that, we can break ourselves of certain patterns of thinking. So anger lasts no more than a few seconds if you suddenly realize there's no one here to be angry. Angry is just... Angry is, a, is an energy pattern that arises in our awareness and we choose to pay attention to it or not. We choose to drag it out longer. We choose, choosing meaning we're conditioned to do it, but we can make a choice. We can actually yes. rise above yes. it. So we don't want to stigmatize people and say, oh, you chose to be angry, right? Precisely. Exactly and right. I would want to be careful about that. And you're just right. Just because anger is like any other human emotion, it sort of shows up as a teacher and we, we can make room for it. Absolutely. And, yeah. Absolutely. And, but, and yet it is also true that we can make choices. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so a s simple exercise is to realize the actual open, spacious, and choiceless aspect of awareness is to pretend for a second like I'm looking at you, and Douglas Harding was the guy who wrote a book on this called On Having No Head. So he was an English uh, uh, philosophy guy. He went into the Himalayas and suddenly had this epiphany where he's like, oh, you know what? I look at you, you have a head. But when I look at myself from the first person point of view and turn attention back on itself, there's no head there. There's just open awareness. It's a single eye that we see out of, right? Because our two eyes really when we actually have an experience, I don't see two viewpoints into the world out of a sausage or a meatball. I see a integrated, beautiful, open, spacious thing. Like right now I see your face looking back at me. But if I really pay attention, you're not looking, you're, you're seeing a face, yeah. but 
what I'm seeing. No, it's very interesting to experiment with that as I'm hearing you describe it. It opens. It's kind of a trip. It's a trip. Yeah. And transiently you go, oh, everything is within my awareness and is, I'm really one with all these things. And it's an open, loving kind of experience that lets go of a lot of suffering, but it's transient because within a couple seconds, thought reintrudes and the self is reconstructed. So in other words, right. Most of the time that I'm talking to you, I have in my mind a very subtle veneer of here's my face, here's my expression, <laughs> yeah. here's what she's seeing, mm-hmm. right? Instead of what's really happening, which is open awareness in which you're appearing and connecting with me. And, and again, it sounds woo-woo. Wow, that is so interesting. It's weird, right? But yeah, it's, it's cool. But it's the centerpiece of Zen and Tibetan Buddhism, just Americanized. So it's like, just pretend you have no head for a second, that just everything's arising on your shoulders. And for a transient second, you feel at one with the universe. You feel at one with the universe. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Now the question is what meaning you make of that. So the biggest danger is you get that experience and you go, so what? In which case you've lost the central teaching, which is, well, actually you can actually practice and get to a point where this kind of selflessness serves you in the world. So you feel more connected, more loving, less egocentric, less separate from others. And that allows you to have compassionate curiosity for the person in front of you. And so I was playing with it while you were talking to me because you were saying these wonderful things. And I'm like, let me feel this in a way. Oh, wow. How connected I feel. And then that is so pretty quickly, the self crawls up your arm and sticks itself onto your face. And you're back in this separate little bubble interacting with other separate little bubbles. So cool. it's interesting. And again, this is since we're in the Bay, we talk about this shit. That's what we do. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And I feel like we could do a whole separate episode on... Um, technology and the way that it interferes with people's ability to connect with one another. You mean this thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's just so, I, I, what I was thinking as you, it's part of what my mind was doing as you were describing that is just also sort of thinking about what it means to have this level of awareness in a conversation. Like many people don't give this to one another anymore, right? Because Absolutely. people are sitting with each other and then they're looking at their phones. Absolutely. And like mm-hmm. being able to connect deeply. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and so this is one thing I've sort of resolved to do on the show mm-hmm. and we were talking before the show started like should we do this live from a phone should right. we should we pre-record it i'm like i want to sit face to face with you mm-hmm. across a table instead of side by side talking to a third party yeah it feels very artificial yeah i'm so glad we did it this way it's so much better yeah so we experience each other in a way that's much more authentic and connected and I make, I'm making much more eye contact than I normally make with human beings, which is, <laughs> yeah. it's hard for me. And I think it, it comes, it, yeah. I think, you know, thinking about it again, trying to do self-reflection, I think that comes from a place of ego uh, weakness. Like, I just feel like if they see who I am, they're not going to like me. Oh, you know? it's weird. Subin. Yeah, I know, but it feels that way. And it's, it's unconscious. And so I'm often, I often talk like someone with, who's mildly on the spectrum. Like I'll just kind of look at the ground and kind of like expand, you know, especially with something that it's I'm not so sure. It's so funny. It's so not how I experience you. Is it? Just, is it? Just like anytime I've ever met you and even just have experienced it, you when I'm watching your interviews with other people, that's just not how I experience how you. How interesting. Maybe yeah. it's a self, uh, a self-reflection thing on my part where that's how I experience myself. Remember I said it feels like something's crawling up and attaching Mm. itself. That's the self that really is harmful to me because Mm -hmm. it's an imaginary construct. And if I'm just open, then I think we have a lot to... We have a lot to exchange, right? Oh, yeah. absolutely. But a lot of times I'm contracted and closed off. And so my resolution was in interviews, I want to be more in that space and more conscious so of that. far so good well Jeez. i don't we'll see we'll see yeah. i hope so i feel connect i feel like i've learned a lot i feel like me too it's and it's interesting because you're telling me what's in your head mm-hmm. which is so fascinating to me yeah like to me that's like the most amazing thing to share someone i love talking to you i feel like we just jam yeah now the audience is like this is the worst interview i've ever seen <laughs> exactly. i don't care this is the basement tapes that's right no, this is just for me and you that's yeah. right that's where my aging prefrontal cortex is like i don't care what you think old man all right i'm gonna do what i like i said that in my recent video i'm like i'm just gonna have interviews with people that i care about yeah. that i think i'm gonna connect with and you know again and i mostly have done that there are a couple yeah. exceptions where i feel i regret having done the interview because i feel like i gave the audience like a a shilly piece of crap you know so it's like it's more like you know and again 
you don't have to agree with everything we say, but I think that it's the conversation. I would assume, I'm going to go ahead and assume that people are going to enjoy this more than things that you did that you didn't enjoy so much, mm. because I think that it's, um, it's just the power of ideas, right? When yeah. we're having like, conversations about things that really light us up, that tends to be what lights other people up yeah. too. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I mean, I think, uh, and there's so much else we could talk about. The question is, do we talk about it now? I know, right? Or do we bring you <laughs> do back? Do we film like a second episode? Right. Do we break? Do I reapply my gloss? <laughs> <laughs> I feel... I'll borrow one of Margaret's it, tops. It, exactly. And pretend like it's like a whole Pretend new it's a day. whole different day. Right, exactly. That's real authentic z fact. Like, that's exactly right. Uh, I, I, think, I think we got to save you... For more episodes because okay. there's so Chris, much I want. Chris has been about. joking, by the way, that he wants me to be your quivers. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. But then I have to step up to like, you know, Howard Stern uh, levels no, of. Uh, we won't go to that level. Chris is Chris is a wonderful human being, by he the way. Is so a people, wonderful human people, being. Have, you should definitely watch the episode I did with him, uh, Beta Brand uh, sponsored episode. It was sponsored, but the only reason I did it was that I love Chris and I think he's a fascinating human being. He's a creative. He's like kind of a bit of a tortured artist. And <laughs> yeah. I, I love that. And uh, he and I always hit it off. In, in Vegas, when I was having my little awakening, he was there like the next week. Oh, really? Yeah. And that's, I think, why I was so open to him as a human being. I was like, oh, this guy really is like he and, and you know what was interesting about chris i don't i've never told you this i've never told chris this i might have told chris this so we're sitting at some bar because tony does all his meetings at bars and again this is all on the show so if there's anything you don't want me to talk about okay okay um yeah i won't we'll, edit, it we'll edit it out later yeah exactly yeah. We'll, we'll clear it up in post yeah, exactly the, the, the he, he was sitting here going so if i'm understanding you you're this and this and you do this but you really want to do this and this is what you're doing and i forget what exactly it was but he was like i was like Dude, you saw me clearly, knowing me for 20 minutes in a way that I can't see myself clearly. How cool. And I was like, that's amazing. And I told Tony, I was like, this guy's like off the off the bell curve. And you know, Tony's like on his phone. He's like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's really, was, cool. Yeah, really you cool. You had never told me that before. That's yeah, nice to hear. And it's no yeah. surprise that uh, that he found someone uh, wonderful like yourself oh, to be you. a part of his uh, dyad. Is that a word? <laughs> I, I Is that think like so. attunement? Yes, yeah. So I think we did a thing today. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I'm going to put this out. I think what we should do is I want to follow up with another show on the cultural overlay of mental illness. In other words, how these diseases, mm -hmm. we're going to use reductions. In quotes. In quotes, manifest in different countries. Sure. They're not the same. And how does that speak to, oh, this is all a chemical imbalance or is this also very much a relational absolutely kind of thing. culturally bound syndromes Ex right culturally yeah. bound syndrome do you think it will end with this do you think that the mass shooting thing is a culturally bound syndrome yes 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 i, I agree think that you. we are i think we are dealing with um an issue of a culturally bound syndrome and we are going now this is going to tease people because we're going to follow up with a whole show on culturally bound syndromes guys weigh in if you want <laughs> dr leslie carr to be the robin quivers on this show <laughs> We're neighbors, practically. Uh, yeah. Let us know in the comments. If you think we're crazy, let us know too. That's fun. Yeah. Um, and I want to thank you for a really... I want to thank you. It's been so fun being here. This has been a real blast. And the call to action is, guys, if you th have insights working with patients about the nature of mental illness and how we can make it better, because that's all that matters. Who cares about it? I'm curious, but who cares unless we can do something? Yeah. And you've brought to light the importance of compassionate curiosity... <laughs> talking to people, understanding and witnessing their suffering and holding it. And that is an important part of therapy in conjunction with medications and the Western medical model together, but never reducing to one or the other. I think that's very powerful stuff that can help all of us. So Dr. Leslie Carr, clinical psychologist, Psy D, exactly. uh, <laughs> and a friend of mine, thank you for being on the show. It has been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, share this, become a supporter, blah, 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 blah. You know the drill. All right, we out. <laughs>